Все то такие же, как я, несчастные, замучены. И мне не на что больше надеяться. Но я могу, понимаете, я могу им помочь. Никто им помочь не может, а я гнида. Я гнида могу. Я честно подойду на том, что могу им помочь. Welcome, everybody, back to Let's Take Five, the podcast where we look at one of the greats of cinema and discuss their excellence and range. My name is Eric Martindale. My name is Austin Luger. And today we are doing our wrap-up of Andre Tarkovsky. The previous films we covered were Ivan's Childhood, Andre Rublev, Solaris, The Mirror, kind of, and Stalker, five films. And this is the wrap-up episode where we kind of discuss uh, the distance we have gone, the distance we have yet to go in regards to Andre Tarkovsky's five movies. Um, shorter episode today, uh, as usual, with the, the wrap-up episode, and let's just get right into it. So, um, what do you think about this uh, Andre Tarkovsky guy? So, I, I made no qualms about it. At the beginning of this, I was nervous going in, because this is like... Like, I'm okay at doing the heavy hitters. Like, I feel I feel rather confident to talk about a, a Kurosawa, a, a Bergman, or even a Fellini. Mm-hmm. Tarkovsky is a, a heavy hitter that I don't... I, I can't, like, improvise a speech about him in the yeah. way I could about Hitchcock. So I really enjoyed this five. It's just, like, a better, like, teaching of myself. And I think I need to do the five again. I think I, I think I will keep, like, watching and rewatching his films throughout my life because you kind of just get more with every age. Um, and well, that's nice. And there's not that many of them. No. Either. Uh, that being a bigger a, a thing of note here, too. But, um, yeah, no, I'm kind of with you. As far as filmmakers are concerned... And as far as making podcasts about filmmakers are concerned, this is the hardest person I think we've covered. Oh, absolutely. As far as like trying to get inside the head and discuss these films. I mean, The Mirror, we basically waved the white flag on. Um, I'm, not, I'm not proud of that, but, yeah. it, but we were honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, I mean, I'm sure if... If you were spending, you you could probably spend an entire season worth of a podcast on Andre Tarkovsky, and in the thirty minutes we have for each film, it's just it's just not enough. Quite frankly, it's just not the in depth enough to to break it. And I think that he's probably the one filmmaker that, that you can say that about. I, I really I don't think there is another one. So I'm kind of in that sense, kind of glad we got him out of the way. Well, he has this. This artistry feel that you almost feel with anyone else because, like, we um, went on about how brilliant of a framer Kurosawa was. Mm-hmm. Now, he could take, like, seven main characters, have them all in the same room, in the same shot, perfectly aligned. And we go, man, how does he do that? The answer is hard work and, and patience. Mm-hmm. I don't know how Tarkovsky did any of this beauty. Like, it is just a, a natural ability that he has to craft a story this way and to understand through lighting and patience um just techniques that are just not obvious and yet like you can tell one of his films rather quickly it's something very special in in you mentioned like his artistry of it but also i think that's kind of how his films roll roll through too right Mm -hmm. um they're Patience is the big word that stuck out to me because it takes it takes pa- patience not only to make films like this or as the filmmaker to allow the films to breathe and eventually become these works of art that they do, but also it takes pr- patience on the audience member. I mean, there's a huge amount of onus that falls on the audience member to decide to roll with it, you know. And sometimes this, if it does click for you and everything sort of falls into uh, into place and it tugs that artistic string that you feel inside of you, you get the reaction that you'll get to something like Solaris and Stalker, which feel like almost um, a transcendent type of um, you know feeling that you get from viewing these works of art and feeling like you get it. Um, and then also the frustration that comes with a movie like The Mirror when you got to just say, I, I don't I don't get it. Um, I understand that there's something happening here. I'm understanding that there's something very beautiful about this. But the wall is just a bit too thick and a bit too impenetrable for me to. But it's not an, it. an intimidating wall. Like I'm looking forward to revisiting The Mirror much in the same way that I'm looking to revisit Demon Stalker. Um, once again, because there's something really special about his films where even though almost every single one starts off very slowly, almost mm-hmm. as a dare to kind of keep you to watching it, you do because there's something just very professional and beautiful going on that 
it's always a pleasant experience as opposed to something that is extremely abstract in a way of like a lot of I don't know early David Lynch is so jarring and annoying how jarring it is. Mm-hmm. Tarkovsky's never annoying. No, the mirror is never annoying. Um, there, there's a phrase that I, I thought of after watching Blow Up for the first time, which is a a more abstract film. And I was like, the second it ended, I just wanted to read like every essay about it. It's like intellectually arousing. Like you just feel like, wow, there, there, there's something. I just want to academically go deeper into this film, and you're almost giddy about it. That's what you gotta feel for a lot of his, and it, it's it, it's striking in that way because, I mean, on paper, Solaris and Stalker are are sci-fi stories that could be told easily within like the Hollywood system, but he adds something new and special to it that, you know, to some could be seen as pretentious, but the others could see it as really beautiful because unlike other people who are too abstract, they could be abstract. All of his films are very humanistic. Yeah. Um, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. I was going to bring up the word pretension. The, the, the only way you get pretentious about it is when you have a film po- podcast talking about, Andre Tarkovsky. Oh, we've but, ruined that for every film too. That's fine. <laughs> but but the movies themselves don't really ever ever feel that way. They they kind of designed like I mentioned a wall earlier, but they're more like a river that you can sort of just let it kind of wash over you, and you know you either you take from what you can from it. I mean, the movie provides, but you know you, you, sometimes you got to you know make a fishing pole and put some line on it to catch something. Um, and a lot of that I feel like could open up further when I watch these films in the future. I have different feelings on Solaris now than I did the first time I watched it, and I'm sure I will the next time I watch it after that. Um, well, it took me three tries to basically crack Andrei Rublev for me. Yeah, like now I think it's a really incredible film, and it's funny because now on the same website, you see me struggle in The Immortals when we reviewed it like a year ago. Right. And now I'm like, I get it. And the answer is be really hungover and watch a three-hour Russian film. And I think that's I think that's really interesting when you're debating any type of art to sort of try to steer clear of absolutes because, mm-hmm. you know, first of all, the internet will always be there to remind you weeks or <laughs> years later oh, yeah. uh, of, of some claim that you made, but also because something like um, Tarkovsky's films, even though they're always going to be what they are... Um, they're a little more fluid, I think, than, mm-hmm. than most films. They don't feel they don't feel as as rigid. Um, you know, you feel like each time you watch it, almost could feel like another iteration of the time that came before. Um, and that isn't to say that I don't think that he. I don't think that he. You, well, actually, this is going to branch off something else. So I was going to say, not that I think that he completely always hit a home run, mm-hmm. or, or, but. There were times where I was so clouded when, like, something wasn't working for me in his films. Mm -hmm. I was always so clouded on trying to figure out what he was going for without ever really considering did he go for something and fail to get it. Mm -hmm. And I don't actually actually know where that line begins and ends. And that's why even a movie like The Mirror, I watch it, and I don't really get anything out of that film, but I don't dislike the film either. I don't think I could write a review for that film because I don't know where to critique it at. I don't know where to start with that. I don't know what, I don't know what there is to say that's wrong with The Mirror, other than I just didn't understand The Mirror, which is so different than the way, first of all, the way you structure a critique or a review, but also makes him unique as far as an artist is concerned. Well, it's it's interesting because I mean, I don't think anyone could listen to these past five weeks and go weird like Tarkovsky fanboys, and I, I mm-hmm. bring up that word because like you know, we've done 75 films now, and that is the only film where we said we don't get it, as opposed to saying the film is wrong. And we've mm-hmm. gone after some Gone after sounds like we're pundits. Um, <laughs> we're not. I think, but we have we have critiqued um, films that are seen as you know some of the best of the best of of cinema. Mm-hmm. We're, we're not saying you know maybe I'm wrong for disliking Clockwork Orange. Maybe you're wrong for using the whole. I had problem. I had problems yeah. with Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like these are, we're talking about some heavy hitters yeah. here. And yet Tarkovsky yeah. is someone where much like. No one says that's that's a bad Monet. <laughs> you 
<laughs> you know? like, yeah. Oh man, he just dropped the ball on that beautiful. Uh, well, like, I think that's a very sort of apropos thing because these these films feel more like they feel more like paintings. Yeah, they're in, museum in, pieces. In, in museum pieces, and I don't. And I don't mean that as like a cop out. I mean literally when you watch them, you sort of experience them mm-hmm. rather than than uh, absorb them. I, I I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. I don't look at a lot of art, but it does feel like you're watching something. Um, even when you don't understand it or you don't feel like you can get it, you can someone else can tell you, you know, that's significant. Mm-hmm. And you can go, yeah, okay, I, I, I hear you. Now, the scene, and I'm just pulling this out of the hat, the scene, the, the, the um, Russian roulette scene from the deer hunter, that, that's always that. And we can, we can see that and we can all have different opinions on that. Um, and that's a, that's a thing. Whereas when you talk about Tarkovsky, Nothing sticks like that. It mm-hmm. just sort of, like I said, like rain down the side of a, a house. It just sort of flows or on by. Inside a house. Or inside a house. <laughs> it just sort of flows on by, and you really don't feel like you got a real handle on it. And there's a sort of, and that works to his advantage sometimes in disguising the actual plot to. to to, to the effect of the plot in some movies like Solaris and Stalker, where I mean, that's why I don't, I can't imagine anyone other than Tarkovsky making a film like Stalker because the whole movie is a is needs to feel that way, which runs concurrent with how he the type of filmmaker he is. Yeah, I mean, the the whole world is not everything could appear ninety nine percent correct, and yet it's one percent wrong. And he's the perfect director for that type of thing because I can't get a handle on what he's trying to emote with his movies anyway. All I can speak to is how his films make me feel. I can't say he went for this and this didn't work. Mm -hmm. I can just say this is how his film made me feel and it either worked for me or it didn't. Um, Which... And I, I understand, like, you, we don't want to be fanboys. And, and certainly, I, I've, we've done other filmmakers, we've done other people, or actors, or, you know, what have you, where I've liked the five films more as a collective, but... I don't think we can be accused of being fanboys, because fanboys have seen all of his films. Yeah. <laughs> We're not nine for nine. Yeah, that, that's, 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 good. That's, a, that's a good point, too. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 it just, he is just... Um, this is very, very special. I don't think you can, and I. This is something I used to say, like when we were originally doing the podcast. I, I've gotten away from this a little bit, but like I don't. You couldn't write a story about the history of film and not mention him in the first fifty pages. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, well, it's also. I mean, it's. I, I don't know much about him as, as a person, but like, it's so curious that Russia is not a big film country. Mm-hmm. They've never really had. The economy yeah. for a, a countrywide cinema presence, except for him and in the silent era. And where, you could argue not him because he couldn't get his movies financed. But I mean, in, yeah. in the history of like world cinema, like mm-hmm. Russia has two big names, Sergei Eisenstein mm-hmm. and Andrei Tarkovsky. For that's a crazy. big country. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big country <laughs> uh, with a very you know, unique perspective on a lot of things. It's just kind of always struggle a bit with movies. I mean... It's doing pretty well in literature and plays. I, yeah. mean, I think it's doing just fine, in fact. Um, but that was going to be a quiet thing. But, man, it's uh, powerful. I mean, the, both of those are true artists of the genre. And, whew, it's good stuff. Yeah, uh, he's he's up there. He, he's he's uh, certainly one of the greats. So, um, typically, again, as we mentioned, these these podcasts are usually shorter, so something we always kind of do for fun is discuss the... Um, oh, you want to rank them, don't you? Yeah. yeah. This is going to be really hard. I think I have mine. Alright, so... Um, it may be not too hard, it's just that it's it feels weird ranking these movies. I think we're on the same list except... The top two. Yes. Yeah, I think so too. Alright, what's your list? Uh, number one, Solaris. Stalker, Andrubalev, Ivan's Childhood, The Mirror. Yeah, um, so <laughs> so I, I count the other way. It's true. Well, I was going for a dramatic, but I realized there's five, yeah. and they also heard our reviews, so like they could guess. <laughs> so I just wanted to get it out there quickly. So yeah. tomorrow's my number one. So yeah, um, number five would be The Mirror for me, four would be Ivan's Childhood, three would be Andre Rublev. 
two would be Solaris and number <laughs> one would be Stalker, but that's that's really close. I mean, Solaris and Stalker are two absolutely incredible films. Yeah, they they, they really are. Um, I think I said more of a personal reaction to Solaris, like that hit more themes that like I enjoy like going into more. But Stalker is like Stalker is one I already want to rewatch again, which is crazy. This is three hour. Slow Russian film, right? No, and I had that. I had that feeling immediately after watching it, as well. Like it's just, um, yeah. I mean, it, it, I think Stalker is. I think both of those films are conversation pieces. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if Stalker had a different ending, that one one again that I could wrap my head around, <laughs> it might be in like my top fifty films ever. There's a book that I saw that's like the making of Stalker and the dissection of Stalker mm-hmm. that like came out in the past like ten years. It looked really good. I want to like read that because like that was a crazy name. Like, well, you, you talk. Let me find the thing. It's well, so the thing was my, my next thing was going to be a question. I, it was going to be a question for you. Um, I was I'll curious. It. Yes, I was curious if you because I actually this is like unique to this. I've never. I haven't seen another Tarkovsky film. Have you seen another Tarkovsky film that we didn't cover here? I think I've seen one. Let me look up his list real fast. Um, have you seen Nostalgia? I have not seen Nostalgia. Um, He's looking up the list right oh, now. This no, look at what this book's called because like, it's a good book. Wait, there it is. Uh, it's called Zona, a book about a film about a journey to a room. Okay. I want to read that book. Yeah, I do. That's, okay. that's pretty interesting. Let's look at what uh, films is here Tarkovsky made. I, I and I often like I, I do think anytime where we have something like this and I, I'm not so familiar with it, I wonder what the um I wonder what the uh the consensus is amongst Tarkovsky fans over which which is the better film of the two. So I have a feeling it's Stalker, but I, I, I don't actually know. I don't well, nope, I have not seen any other films. Um there were some people who we kinda of posted our list saying that we should have swapped out nostalgia for the mirror. Yeah. I heard someone say that for Stalker, too, when we posted the list. Which, for Stalker? Yeah, I think it was one of your friends. Anyway, I don't know. I don't want to call him out on here, because no, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a wrong opinion. <laughs> well, I know that Ed, who was a guest for Under Blev, yeah. uh, Stalker is like one of his like, top five films of all time. Yeah. But I think he also loves nostalgia, so I don't know where that would drink. Mm-hmm. So, Well, I, I I pulled the mirror out of the hat there, too. That's fine. I'm glad I watched it again. Yeah. I, I think I barely watched it back in college, and now I've seen it again still don't get it. So third time's charm for Tarkovsky, so I'm going to really nail yeah, it. I mean, <laughs> you nailed Tarko- or, uh, Rublev last time. Yeah. It's so interesting that he would be doing a film about a painter. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously... There's a reason. Yeah. There's a reason. <laughs> yeah. There's a connection there. So, um... As is typical for our mm-hmm. wrap-up episodes, we talk about the next five we are going to cover. Oh, yeah. So so you you threw me off, because I've had a couple of directors in the can, like, okay, boy, we are going to cover X now. And then we do a five, I go, no, it is not the time. It's not the time. Sometimes it's your doing, sometimes it's my doing, because the director I want to do, that was ready to do, like, next, and it's, it's too similar to Linklater. So I did it to myself. <laughs> so <laughs> Okay, we, so we I... We'll eventually... So how many times have I thwarted you, would you say? Um, on... Just a couple. This one, this was my biggest pivot, because we watched these, and although they were fantastic films, I was like... They're heavy. They're heavy. And I was saying lighter. So I was thinking about, like, what's a good like, action route we can do? And I was looking at some, like, ideas, and I realized, like, oh, for every like, person I thought, we had already covered one of their films, because we've done superhero films and Spielberg and some other cool things. Mm-hmm. And I realized we have not covered one film of one of my favorite genres... That's the musical genre. <laughs> Musicals. Hells, yeah. So this one was true. Oh, wait, I, I, th- I think everyone just turned off the podcast. Oh, fuck. <laughs> it's just us now. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's tricky because musicals, because, I mean, if I list like, all my favorite musical films, there's not often a common one artist in them. And I don't want to do someone like Sondheim, because Sondheim didn't make these films, much like how I'd love to do a, a Shakespeare five. But he didn't make we these were, films. We were very close to doing it. Oh, we were that. like a couple days away. <laughs> yeah, we were. And then I realized, I don't think this would work. Because mm-hmm. we're going to discuss a guy who wasn't alive. Yeah, we, could, we threaded the needle with with uh, superhero films, but, but that, it would have been even yeah, harder. But it was still like an intention being made by the, sure. the idea. So this is, this is I'm looking forward to this because we're going to do Gene Kelly. 
who I think is actually rather underrated as an American director because his scope and uh, finesse with the camera is actually rather understated because he can do the the grandness of a musical while also like doing it right. It helps that he's like the guy, I mean the choreographer and star of them as well. But we have a kind of a, a cool lineup that, that's gonna that's gonna test me a little bit and uh, and look at um, entertainment in a in a lighter way. So the five we're gonna do are in American in Paris, Singing in the Rain, It's Always Fair Weather, The Young Girls of Rochefort, and Xanadu. Now, before I get into why we pick these five, uh, how much are you not looking forward to the next five weeks? <laughs> you know, it's it's weird because I'm a, um, you know, I I've, I've been around musical theater my whole life. You're a theater I, major. I'm a theater major. I was a theater major. I graduated <laughs> with a theater degree, but I, you know, I dated uh, many uh, uh, musical theater people. I've 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 been friends with many people with beautiful voices. I cannot sing, so oh, I had that, that that nice distinction of being the one friend that couldn't mm-hmm. um, amongst many talented, many, many talented people, but um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't dislike musicals. There are mm-hmm. some musicals I, I really, really love. I've just never been a... And if I'm going to the theater, then I have... I'm really into it. Mm-hmm. Um... I just don't have a deep affection for um, musicals on film, um, and I, I'm not the only one. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! It is a, a divisive genre. I mean, there, to be sure. there are some here and there, I, I, but you know, it's as American as apple pie. I mean, it, it's like the western. There's a musical, you know, what have you. I mean, it's it's almost to me the opposite of a, of a horror film. Some people go, "This is the most fun you can have in theater." That people go, "This is torture." Please don't make me watch this. I'm going to cover my eyes the entire time. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, because it's 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 taking this fantastical element and going crazy with them. Except yeah. for the quality of films is way different because there's at least a hundred million better musical films <laughs> than there are horror films. I mean, that's I, true. I, yeah. prefer, I prefer the genre of horror better, mm-hmm. but the fact of the matter is there's not that many good horror films. That's true. So, and there's plenty of good musicals. Yeah, and this this five would be be curious because we have five. Um, very different films because um, I have not uh, rewatched these yet at the time of this recording, and one of these I haven't even seen yet, which is uh, I've never done before. Uh, but American in Paris, Best Picture winner, uh, not directed by Kelly, which I keep forgetting, but um, definitely it's, Kelly still had a lot of creative control. Um, Probably more than the director. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean there's a 15 minute dance sequence again. <laughs> that is a, kind of a Kelly staple. Uh, Sing in the rain. On every AFI list of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, super fun. It's always fair weather. It's Gene Kelly doing a darker subject matter with still the lightness of Hollywood. The Young Girls of Rushford is going to be super fun to do because Kelly is, is barely in the movie, but it's almost a movie about Kelly. It is uh, the amazing uh, French director Jacques Demy who made uh, either this is the most popular film or it's The Umbrella of Sherberg. But both have the same idea of the entire movie is singing and it's in French. And this one, more than that one, is looking at and enjoying the Hollywood musical that Kelly kind of helped create. And then the last one is, um, this could be a disaster of an episode, but is looking at the entertainment of a bad movie. Uh, Xanadu is a notoriously bad movie that I've not seen. I'm excited to watch. And uh, we're going to, much like, uh, look at the entertainment of just uh, singing and dancing and maybe a world not even close to being our own. We're going to look to see if a, a bad movie can be worth talking about for 30 minutes. It could be a failure of an episode, but I'm excited. Uh, yeah, there should be a podcast about that. Oh, a podcast of bad movies? <laughs> I don't think those are out there. <laughs> I don't um, think those exist. <laughs> and, and hopefully we'll, we will have a guest that, that knows how to sing better than you and I. Oh, uh, I should ask her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know for a fact that she does. Oh, good. She's still on. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so that's it. That's it for my end. Anything you want to add? Nope. Well, uh, we have one more thing to add because we are not going to do American in Paris on Friday. Oh, yeah. Because uh, Friday, Friday the 13th. And also, um, we enjoyed last year doing an episode just about horror films. And uh, since you said there are not that many great horror films, we have to prove ourselves wrong and discuss five more that are... I, I really was like... Right now, I realize these aren't the five next best ones. I think these are five fun ones that you can watch in a group. I think it's almost better to say five Halloween movies as opposed to necessarily horror movies. Right. So I'm looking at this list. 
I mean, comedy horror, I guess, is a genre. We got that on there. It is. We got and that. one, I think, is a pretty long stretch, but I think it works. And also, Halloween comes next year, too. It's true. You know, we don't want to blow the whole lot, you know? No, 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 no. So okay. there we go. So come back next Friday. We're going to do now our second annual uh, fun look at horror films. And uh, then we'll start Gene Kelly 5. So get excited. No. But you know where to find us. You know, Art of Mortal, Dave Comments, yeah. Podcasts. You, you can it. listen to all those advertisements on the, the other, the other ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. All right. Well, uh, my name's Eric Mardo. I'm Austin Luger. And we'll catch you later. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. The characteristics of an Andrei Tarkovsky film are many. Uh, one is its uh, complexity, the complexity of its style, uh, the complexity of its narrative, uh, and its unabashed subjectivity. Andrei Tarkovsky's films um, lead us into an inner world, into a dream world very often, um, into the dream world of the characters as well as kind of the, the inner world of the director himself. Uh, after seeing Ivan's childhood, uh, Bergman was reputed to have said, it's been quoted often, that Tarkovsky was the greatest filmmaker because he could capture life as appearance and life as a dream. <laughs>